very much, Professor Forgo and dear participants. Uh, thanks for, for having me. Um, it's a big pleasure to, um, to be virtually uh, in, in Vienna. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen and then we can get right on it. There we go. Just a second. All right. Now, um, thank you so much for this uh, very, very nice uh, introduction that uh, 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 spans the, the kind of research uh, I've, I've been doing and I'll be uh, drawing from, uh, from that research as I'll uh, talk to you about the role and relationship of different kinds of, uh, of law, of different kinds of norms in, uh, in governing uh, uh, platforms. Regulating, regulating softly but carrying a big normative stick that might sound dangerous but it's a, a phenomenon that we see uh, the the interrelation between hard law and soft law is something that is both intricate and important uh, for uh, online speech rules and we'll talk about how those different kinds of norms interact in a second we'll also talk about what hard law is what what soft law is what we have seen over the last uh, years, um, and especially during the, the two years of the corona crisis, is a strong, a strong focus um, of, um, of both public attention and of uh, public criticism on the way that online uh, platforms deal with content. Uh, just one one day in in January uh, of 2021 was called the 9/11 moment of social media. Uh, platforms were heavily criticized for banning uh, a sitting head of, uh, of 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 state of government. Uh, not that they hadn't done that in the past, but this time it was somebody who obviously mattered to to German uh, speaking and an English speaking uh, media. Um, and the um, the strong focus on online uh, communication during the the Corona crisis has brought uh, very much to the fourth the role of platforms in setting the rules under which a lot not all but a lot of online discussion uh, is taking place discussion and discourses which are important for the way that we uh, navigate the big questions of our societies where do we want to go what decisions do we want to make. Should we get vaccinated or shouldn't we? What do we believe is truth? How do we want our societies to look uh, like in the future? Those are questions which um, are uh, now to a substantial degree debated online. Um, and we're seeing new new developments where actors that we haven't heard before, you know, like oversight boards are suddenly in the main uh, uh, in the main focus of, um, of of normative discussions, of discussion on rules, and we will talk about those different actors uh, as our um, as the presentation progresses. We'll talk about who is responsible for setting rules, who is responsible for implementing uh, online rules. Now, before I, I start, let me please uh, re reiterate that. Um, if you have any question, please go ahead and ask it. This is supposed to be an interactive format. You know, we are losing a bit uh, personal interaction by having moved online, but um, we. Uh, but I feel that it's really important that uh, you're able to to connect. Uh, that we're able to connect uh, on a um, uh, uh, at least on an, on an online level. Now, may, let me just ask for a second. I'm using two screens. Are you seeing the the big screen? Is that all going well? Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, two screens are always a, a big, a big challenge. Uh, that is to say, for you know, relative novices like me, not for experts in all things computer and, and media like like Professor Forger. Now, um, Professor Forger was nice enough to mention normative orders. Uh, those things might sound you know airy and scary, perhaps, but I can assure you they do exist. There's even a building where it says normative orders on it. Uh, so if you want to, you know build a fancy new university building, you just have to get one of those excellence, uh, excellence grants and some space, of course. Um, now, what is a normative order? You'll meet that concept a couple of times. It's one of my you know, a concept which I find rather helpful. Normative order just means a set of rules uh, and the narratives that support those rules. So the stories that we tell ourselves about those rules that um, 
justify and stabilize how rights and duties are distributed in a society. That's a normative order. There can be a normative order uh, based on laws. That would be like the normative order of the state. There can be a normative order within a platform, which would be then based primarily on private rules. But um, as I was uh, working in that building for four or five years, um, I also encountered uh, the normative orders of Carolingian knights and of Tunisian uh, revolutionaries. So every societal segment can have a normative order. All right, now let's use that uh, term. I see there's a question in the chat. Let me see. Um, Ms. Griffin asks, uh, is there a difference between normative order and ideology? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I, um, a normative order can support a certain ideology, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, ide ideologies can uh, uh, can be the source of the narratives that stabilize a normative order, but uh, uh, the, the 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 normativity of, of the order is what I would argue puts it apart from from ideology. Ideologies is not are not uh, intrinsically normative, uh, but I would assume that any strong or normative order has a certain underlying uh, ideology. With, with a well a neutral approach to ideology right because ideology doesn't have to be uh, doesn't have to be per se a, a negative term you can have a pro-democratic ideology um, and that would be not the worst thing ever now what are we going to talk about in the following uh, 75 or so uh, minutes um, Andrea asks, what are the connected narratives regarding the normative uh, order? Uh, connected in the sense means they're shared by the community. So they, so they can be connected amongst each other. They usually are because uh, narratives which uh, do not, uh, uh, are not um, connected usually are not very strong. It's just like, you know, like when you weave something, right? Do you know that, that notion of weaving a narrative, right? The stronger you put something together, the more fibers it has, the more smaller stories, and the better they interlink, the stronger the fabric, the stronger the narrative. So uh, yes, they would be connected to each other and shared by the community. If uh, a community long, no longer shares a narrative, usually that will be the start of the end of an order, right? Then comes the revolution and the start of a stronger order, which is, uh, which is supported by stronger narratives. Now. We will talk about uh, the role of soft law, hard law, and their uh, role, relationship, and potential. What is soft law? What is hard law? Soft law are norms which are not um, enforceable through a centralized um, state or authority. Um, those rules can, however, be extremely effective. Um, they can be uh, enforced, for instance, through uh, uh, technology. They can be enforced through private uh, rules uh, and rulers on platforms. But uh, they cannot be enforced, not usually be enforced by a central state authority, as hard law would be. Uh, soft law, then, is the, uh, the body of rules applicable uh, to how platforms regulate uh, their um, their, their, their business, how they regulate online communication uh, on their platforms. Uh, and they are one aspect of how online speech can be regulated. Hard law, so the law that is um, introduced and uh, implemented by states, is the other dimension. And we'll also come to a third category, uh, and you'll be happy that you've waited for that. We'll talk about the role and relationship of those two categories, uh, and we'll look specifically at how they impact how platforms are, are governed. Now, um, I don't know whether you remember your, your days of learning English, um, where when, when, when uh, the, the teachers would tell you this beautiful example of visiting relatives can be a nuisance, then would look at you and see whether you notice the two dimensions of that. Indeed, visiting relatives can be a nuisance, and visiting relatives can be a nuisance, right? So at the same time, it's the act of doing something and those people who are coming to visit you. The same thing here is governing platforms can be dangerous, as in, if you try to govern how a platform does its business, uh, this can lead to a reduction in innovation. This can lead to loss in, 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 uh, in, in the communicative freedoms. But at the same time, if those platforms start to govern, that also can start to be rather dangerous, especially if, as happened during the last years, they prime their um, algorithmic uh, content optimization engines, not so much on public values, but rather on goals such as maximization of profit. That doesn't necessarily lead to better results for the 
democratic uh, discourse uh, that is necessary for you know for for societies to to uh, keep um, to to ensure a social a minimum of social cohesion. Before we enter into the nuts and bolts of platform discussions, uh, let me um, clarify a few, or let me assuage a couple of fears. So first of all, um, I am not convinced that there is actually a fundamental threat to democracy posed by platforms. I know this is something, a sort of a narrative that is shared by a lot of researchers. Some of them want to, you know, they want to sell books, they want to sell their, their papers, or they want people to read their papers. Um, but I'm not convinced that there's actually a fundamental threat to democracy posed by the way that platforms uh, operate, especially now as states have realized that not regulating platforms might not be the best thing and have in the last years, especially now with a view to, you know, to, to, to Brussels, have started to provide for uh, some um, sensible rules uh, that, uh, that, that limit uh, how platforms um, uh, our platforms. Um, act with regards to the content on them. There is also no uh, fundamental information crisis. Rather, uh, the issue is that the people, um, that people um, have problems um, managing their own information flows. Um, this is rather a problem of, of information management, um, of assessing the validity of information, of assessing the quality, the integrity of information, of understanding where exactly they get their information from and how to uh, assess its, uh, its, its importance for your private decision-making processes. Um, research also does not uh, clearly show that there are actually negative effects of uh, filter bubbles. Um, there are some filter bubbles within uh, specific uh, uh, rather extremist categories of, uh, of, of information users. So we can see that. We can see that certain extremist groups tend to become more extremist. But if you look at a, uh, at a, at a uh, let's say, whole of information calculation, something like an Informationsgesamtrechnung, so if you look at all the information people get now, compare that with the information they got um, a decade ago or two decades ago, we are at the exact opposite of a filter bubble because we get so much more information right now. Now, yes, there are tendencies uh, of, as I've said, of extremist groups, of smaller groups to become smaller and more extremist. Um, uh, but the, the bigger problem right now is not that, uh, that filter bubbles exist, but rather that there are connections being made by platforms between uh, groups that probably shouldn't be connected, you know. When you look at, uh, you know, the, the normal examples for those are uh, the, the anti-government uh, anti uh, corona uh, protests. Uh, if you look at the kind of groups which are, uh, are there, um, you'll find, um, you know, people from the right and uh, fans of, of uh, alternative medicine and uh, some some of the the the, the, the more left uh, elements of, of the greens and you find sort of that you have people connected with a common narrative namely the government is doing something bad or the government is trampling on our freedoms and those people a lot of those people um, are being connected through um, the, uh, the 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 uh, slightly blind algorithmic optimization uh, engines, uh, the recommender uh, algorithms of platforms, which do not quite see the potential danger of uh, combining groups that do not share a, uh, let's say, a, a very pro-social approach to uh, individual responsibility. So, so much for the, the, the filter bubbles. Um, we're also seeing only a rather limited impact of, um, of disinformation uh, because we, as social scientists, really have trouble assessing the impact of information. Uh, how um, th There are no, no studies that, uh, that clearly show the impact of any one particular piece of information on anybody else. Um, so while it is totally okay to uh, study how disinformation impacts, try, uh, to try to study how disinformation, disinformation impacts democratic processes and societal development, it's extremely hard to show that any one disinformation campaign has any particular uh, impact. What has often more impact, especially in the awareness of disinformation, is the reporting on disinformation. And that is actually something that those actors that share disinformation are really happy about. Because what is their goal? Well, their goal is 
to make people feel that there is a lot of disinformation around and that um, they can't trust the authoritative news sources, right? And when those exact authoritative news sources, the you know the, the public television, talks all the time about all of that disinformation around, they're kind of doing the business of those disinformation actors. Um, right. That being said, it is still extremely important to understand how to make platforms safer uh, with a view to safeguarding both individual rights and public values, like um, the, the, the freedom to, to, um, uh, to develop democratic uh, ideas and to form opinions and to share opinions and other important democratic values, including social cohesion. Uh, just, just last week, we've had the uh, the uh, nice uh, we got the nice news that we our um, Horizon 2020 project we've applied for is going to be funded, and in the project we will look at um, ensuring more resilient uh, post-pandemic uh, online discourses uh, for a stronger uh, Europe, and we'll be looking exactly at that question: how to make democratic processes, online democratic discourse, uh, uh, more resilient, uh, and uh, fight off both uh, nasty algorithms and uh, disinformation. Now, why, why, why are we talking about that? Why is, uh, why is this a problem? Why is it so hard to, um, to, to understand which norms apply to, to, to online speech on platforms? Because there are new actors, especially those platforms, but also gatekeepers, and also new media actors. Um, think about the, uh, if you look at the 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 uh, the, the best ten uh, uh, the the ten most watched YouTube videos, uh, which should of course be uh, uh, Professor Forgo's uh, uh, YouTube series. But um, if you look at the, the the videos or look at the ten most watched uh, TikTok people, those are important media actors. But they're not traditional media actors, right? They're influencers. Um, or they do unpacking, or they comment on on, on something from a uh, not not necessarily from the from an extremely political perspective. So you have extremely you have new media actors which influence uh, online discourses. You have uh, new gatekeepers, um, and you have new platforms, new actors that influence how media uh, media how information is produced and consumed. Uh, and those actors um, uh, develop have developed in the past uh, uh, new uh, norms. The processes of developing those norms and executing those norms are now more uh, de-hierarchized than before. Traditionally, you know, you had a state that passes laws which is applicable to its people and the police will enforce that, right? This whole process uh, in online discourse spaces, on online platforms, is much more chaotic. You have uh, individual uh, platforms uh, producing terms of service and community standards, which are being uh, implemented by, um, by algorithmic, by automated uh, decision-making uh, systems. Um, you can then, if you're unhappy with such a decision, go to a court. A court might review the terms of service. Those terms of service might, in certain circumstances, be found to be illegal under the law of one state, but might not be under the law of a different state. So we're now we have now entered a, an age of a certain um, a certain normative chaos, if you will. Uh, that's uh, one of the the one of the topics I, I discussed in, in, in my, my, my latest book on the normative order of, of the internet. So is there such a thing as a normative, a normative chaos? You'll be happy to hear, no, there is still underlying normative order. But a phenomenon which we're seeing is there is now much, many more new actors passing norms, new um, power relationships between uh, the, 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 those that um, produce norms and that they implement them. Um, there's also, uh, con conversely, a, a stronger concentration of uh, norm production and norm execution within uh, single actors. Think about the the important um, the important uh, added value to uh, to legal history that was produced uh, by by Enlightenment uh, when it came to uh, when it came to the separation of of, of powers. We have a reduction of that separation of powers and a concentration when it comes to exercising power in online spaces. Why? Well, who sets the rules in online spaces, who executes those rules, and who then judges uh, whether that execution was okay? Platforms, right? Twitter says, well, we're going to delete that. 
based on the uh, on our own rule we have set before, and then we're going to review it ourselves. Yes, as I said before, sometimes you can then go to a court. The court might, um, in single instances, say that uh, this or that application was perhaps um, based on a, a wrong uh, assessment of the fundamental rights involved. But those will be single cases, singular cases, right? The vast majority of, uh, of online speech regulation is happening based on private rules executed by companies and then reviewed by companies. The one, the one thing which is we're slowly getting towards is that um, one has a right uh, to, to have at least uh, a human review of, an of, a, of a decision to have content removed, right? That's something which, for instance, is provided for in the Digital Services Act uh, proposal. Um, mm -hmm. Regarding fundamental rights, we're seeing a horizontalization of norms, right? So we're seeing a strong trend um, uh, towards um, a, a sort of a, a sort of a counter um, a counter trend to this privatization of norm execution. We're seeing uh, a trend by uh, courts, um, especially in, in in Germany of late, to uh, have platforms. Uh, 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 apply uh, fundamental rights directly and to force them to undergo to, to, to perform uh, fundamental rights assessments right so platforms are regularly asked now to, to assess um, to, to um, compare uh, the rights involved when making a removal decision again in singular cases those that do reach courts you know they have to uh, weigh their own rights the rights of the users concerned and also the rights of the user uh, of the the information rights of the the other users who might have wanted access to a particular piece of content that was removed and in that process we're seeing a convergence of private and public law public law providing the basis private law uh, providing much of the uh, of the uh, of the rules applicable to to online uh, to to online speech. So in a way, there's a double privatization, right? Speech is happening in private spaces, and that speech is governed by rules set by private actors, um, executed by uh, private actors, and then reviewed by private actors. And um, only in very singular instances and cases we will see a sort of a, a public law anchor when, when, when courts um, uh, review um, privatized uh, norm execution and will sometimes uh, correct that and, 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 and force um, YouTube channels to, to open again or pieces of, uh, of, of content to be, uh, to be reinstated. So that's kind of a sort of the, a, a quick and dirty big picture of where we're standing at. And I'd like to, to use the, the remainder of, of my time here to talk with you about why uh, uh, we are at this situation now and about the, the fundamentals which I see uh, applicable to this situation. And then we'll see whether perhaps we come to the conclusion that we're heading into the right or the wrong direction or that we are uh, witnessing a, um, a a revolution of of how norms um, um, develop and apply online. Now, first of all, uh, Ms. Fernandez has asked why are German courts more inclined to mandate that fundamental rights are applied by platforms. Well, uh, German courts uh, love the concept of horizontal application of human rights. Uh, for 60, 70 years, they've developed this concept, saying that in certain circumstances, when actors when private actors become important enough, influential enough, then they also have to respect uh, human rights. There's a, a strong line of cases starting from the loot judgment across the so-called stadium ban, stadion verbot judgment. There's another judgment which is so cool, I have to tell it every time, it's called the beer dosen flash mob, the beer bottle flash mob judgment. Uh, and this line of cases continues until today. Uh, there was a judgment recently on the third way party and on, on Facebook. And in all of those cases, the court said, yes, when a company gets so important, so strong, so so powerful that it acts de facto as a state with regard to its own little private order, its own little private fiefdom, then it has to, uh, uh, it has to respect the uh, fundamental rights of uh, different uh, parties. Uh, Eileen, I'm very happy to do that. So the first case was the Stadionverbot case. The second was the 
spear, those in flash mob, and then you had the Fraport case, then you have third week, and then you have the Facebook judgment. I did write a bit about that in an article which I can link later on. Uh, uh, there we go. All right, now. Um, all right, now uh, let's go back to the basics. I promised you a bit of basics. First of all, why do states have to care? Well, states have to care how rights are developed online and how imp they're implemented online because they have human rights related duties, right? They have a duty to ensure to everybody within their jurisdiction uh, a number of human rights. I'm not telling you anything new here, right? Just, you know, Article 19, uh, helpfully both the same in the uh, Universal Declaration and in the uh, Civil Covenant, we all have a right to freedom of opinion and expression. And then, you know, in the in the uh, visionary language of the of, of 1945, through any media, regardless of frontiers, as if uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, who helped drafting uh, the the helped draft the, the Universal Declaration, as if she had known about the future of of media, right? So, Article 19 and all other human rights tell states that they are required to ensure human rights to, to everybody uh, online. Now, uh, similar here, uh, Article 19, 2 of the uh, International Civil Covenant, here too, individual expression in the widest sense needs to be protected without interference, uh, unless uh, those interference uh, is, is met with certain uh, conditionalities, and those conditionalities are, are met, uh, including, you know, the traditional ones, there has to be a, a legal reason, there has to be a legitimate reason, there has to be a proportionate relationship between the interference and the reason. I'm not going to tell you more about uh, you know human rights dogmatics here. So states are obliged to ensure human rights, hard law. Now, do they have to do that online? Yes, they have to do that online as well. We've known that for quite some time as well. One source you can cite if you want to is the biannual resolution of the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council is the most important uh, UN uh, human rights uh, organ meeting in Geneva. and in its biannual resolutions on helpfully entitled um, human rights on the internet. Um, it always says and starts that it affirms that the rights that people have offline must also be protected online. All rights, yes, but in particular freedom of expression. Why in particular? Well, because freedom of expression is a gateway, a gateway right to online, uh, online discourse, uh, to, to other human rights through online discourse. How do you exercise your right to education online? Well, through freedom of expression and freedom of information. How do you exercise your right to health online? Your right to seek out, for instance, health-related information? Well, again, keyword here, information. Through freedom of expression, through freedom of information, all right? So we have hard law standards regarding the application and applicability of, of human rights online, the duties that states have. Those uh, duties, uh, the duty of states to ensure, to, to respect, protect, and implement human rights for all of its citizens, all those um, under their territory and control, sorry, uh, is challenged by the factors which I've identified before, right? The private actors, the powerful companies, the new instruments which they use, their own private little legal orders, the, the, the speech that communication uh, is happening at, the, the permanence of information, right? Uh, legal systems used to say, you know, you know, if you you you, know, you might you might want to if you if you do um, say something bad about a person if you if you if you say that to somebody in a in a closed circle circle that is not that big of a problem and we won't punish you for that but you you know if it's a bigger circle and more people notice that even if it's just a fleeting comment we will punish you now what if that is a comment that will stay online forever does that does not not fundamentally change how uh, states would have to uh, look at uh, how they regulate um, uh, online hate speech so speed of communication permanence and also the the use of um, of ai based tools challenges how um, states um, implement online uh, online uh, online rights um, but what is true on a universal level is also true on a on a on a regional level. Uh, in each region, from the uh, uh, from the uh, from the American uh, Declaration of, of Human sorry the American Convention on Human Rights to the African Charter on Peoples and uh, and Human and People Rights, 
to um, uh, first um, uh, developments of um, uh, of human rights declarations uh, within the uh, Association of uh, Southeast Asian Nations to the European Convention on Human Rights. They all include duties for states to ensure freedom of expression and information and in the jurisprudence of the European Court of, uh, of, of Human Rights, the internet is regularly uh, confirmed as a catalyst for individuals to exercise their rights and needs to be protected, the internet, the access to the internet and access to information, because it facilitates the realization of many other human rights. Now, those duties do not only are not only incumbent upon states, but they, these duties, the duties to protect online uh, online discourse, online speech, to enable online communication, uh, are also um, to a lesser degree uh, incumbent upon uh, private uh, private actors. We're still in the realm of um, so we were now slowly exiting the realm of hard law and moving towards soft law. One of the key, um, but this is soft law, which is starting to get really hard, uh, as in uh, more and more, uh, more and more, um, uh, let's say, binding, uh, because uh, it has been established, while well, it has been established some, some 15 years ago, uh, the so-called Rocky principles on the responsibility of, of transnational corporations have entered international, uh, in international uh, uh, law and um, are now uh, being, being seen uh, as um, a very influential source on how platforms and other uh, international companies have to um, have to um, uh, how they deal with their uh, human rights duties. Now, intermediaries, internet companies, internet platforms under those so-called ruggy principles have uh, a certain uh, duties under both international and national law, while they do not have the, the full gamuts of duties to respect, protect, and implement human rights as states do, they have the duty to respect human rights of their, of their users and of other affected parties, that is non-users, and they have to refrain from violating uh, human uh, rights of users and affected parties. They have to be responsible in complying with applicable laws and regulatory frameworks. So for instance, the approach move fast and break things or do something and then ask for forgiveness later is not something, is not an approach that is in keeping with, um, with their, their, their duties. They're also responsible for uh, developing um, internal rules uh, that um, ensure that they, can, uh, that they can implement their international duties. Uh, that is to say, duties not to uh, not to not to violate human rights of their users. Let's say a company opens up a huge communication space in a country, and they decide not to hire enough native speakers to moderate that content. Then that platform is used to spread hate and to ferment uh, genocide. Um, is that a problem under under international law? Yes, it is, as we see in Facebook's involvement in in Myanmar. Uh, and we we know from um, a number of, of UN uh, uh, monitoring missions and UN reports that uh, the platform has uh, failed in ensuring that its uh, online uh, uh, communication uh, sphere uh, in Myanmar over a couple of years was adequately policed, with the result that the platform was used as a tool by the uh, ruling elites to to spread hate and to um, and to spread uh, anti anti Rohingya uh, views and opinions, and as we know from uh, uh, two different uh, legal challenges right now brought in front of both Argentina and in front of the International Court of Justice, the role of of, of Facebook uh, is is um, uh, the Facebook has obviously violated its international and national duties and rights, um, the rights of their users and, and non-users here. So, um, and there would be nobody arguing against that, right? So you wouldn't find anybody saying, well, you know, I mean, the platform, you know, the, the ruggy principles are not formally binding, so the platform didn't do anything wrong there. And um, the fact that there are, there are no, even Facebook is not making the case that it's not bound by a duty not to be used as a platform to spread hate and, uh, and, and, and genocide. 
that argument is one that pushes the rugged principles towards a such a strong position that it uh, that they can be considered as um, as um, as, as binding upon uh, upon platforms, um, we, we've seen that development in other uh, platforms. Sorry, in other uh, companies, um, in a, with regard to other companies as well. Um, for instance, nowadays um, you would not find a, a clothing company that would say, um, "Well, it's we don't actually know who produces our clothes in Southeast Asia, but you know." Even if it's children, well, I mean, they got to do something, right? You wouldn't find that, right? I mean, this is not something which is which is considered uh, okay anymore. Uh, it's also something that's illegal under a number of um, uh, ILO um, conventions, International Labour Association organization, and which are then translated into um, international law. Um, just this example would be the Lieferkettengesetz, so the law regarding uh, regarding value chains, uh, which uh, is going to substantially uh, influence how platforms um, exercise their responsibility with regard to other actors uh, in their own value uh, creation uh, chain. Right. Now, um, in assuming that duty and in implementing that duty, platforms have to um, uh, develop rules internal rules and develop execution uh, mechanisms that ensure that they do not violate um, that they do not violate uh, international uh, rules and national rules this has become especially important in pandemic times as more and more uh, discourse has uh, has moved um, has moved online all right so we've talked a bit about international rules um, national rules have also more and more strongly impacted how, how platforms uh, develop. Um, just two examples. The Network Enforcement Act, that's the, the German uh, law on obliging platforms to delete specific kinds of content and to report uh, regarding their practices, to report how they educate their platform um, employees um, and, to provide, uh, and to provide government with, uh, with, with insights into how they, they, they manage online um, communication. And the Austrian equivalent, the communications platform uh, law, uh, has, uh, has similar things for, um, for, for platforms um, in Austria. Now, uh, both of those laws have, um, international, uh, have been copied internationally. The Network Enforcement Act, as one of its first, um, is, now, um, is now used in, in similar form in about 19 countries, from Kenya to Malaysia. Um, uh, not always with the same uh, legal protection uh, as the, the Network Enforcement Act uh, had, but uh, with a um, but but the, uh, the the law was influential in um, in defining perhaps in, in being the first uh, approach towards regulating how uh, companies regulate their their online spaces and in uh, in, in providing duties uh, regarding um, uh, information. Uh, providing duties for companies to inform uh, the public about the kind of takedowns they have, the kinds of rules they apply. And in uh, also in its second and third um, reform, uh, giving users the right to have content reinstated that was wrongfully removed. Now, of course, if something um, uh, after, after a sort of, uh, after a couple of years of, of critical uh, of critically thinking about the impact that platforms have, uh, Brussels also sprang into action uh, with uh, four new um, normative approaches to platform uh, governance. This year and the next year, we'll see the, uh, the coming uh, into force of four big um, rule rules regarding uh, online communication that impact online communication. The Digital Services Act, applicable to, to, to platforms, especially with regards to their relationship to private um, users. The DSA, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, uh, but if you're, if you're interested, um, I invite you to consult the, um, the, the currently the version of the parliament which is being debated. It's really an interesting piece of legislation. It includes substantial duties for platforms. Um, including if there are big platforms, duties to uh, provide um, assessments as to the risks they pose for uh, states, for public uh, uh, order, for, uh, for public health too. Um, 
In the current version, there's a duty to uh, provide such a risk assessment every time the uh, product changes. That's something that scares platforms a lot because um, as their algorithm is adapted very often, technically, at least looking at the, the language of the parliament suggestions right now, they have to provide such an assessment every time they, they change the algorithm. So they're not too happy about that. They're seeking to, 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 to reduce that. Um, but not only users are protected, the Digital Markets Act uh, protects uh, uh, those companies which are under the control of major gatekeepers, um, which is not always a bad thing. Uh, if you think about, for instance, the recent case of Telegram, uh, Telegram has been very reluctant to implement any uh, any of the the orders uh, provided by German authorities, they have been very unhappy, uh, very un unhelpful, uh, and um, apparently the only pressure point which was successfully applied were the gatekeepers. In that case, uh, Google and, and Apple, uh, so both of the those of those who who control the um, the app stores. I think it's ninety seven percent of um, of app traffic goes through the stores controlled by those two, um, and apparently German authorities. Um, uh, cooperated with those um, uh, gatekeepers in order to uh, exercise pressure on uh, on uh, on Telegram. Now, in that case, it was probably for the for the good, but those gatekeepers can also, as we know from the past, um, misuse their power, and that's where the Digital Markets Act comes in. And then the two next acts, the Data Act and the uh, AI Act, uh, both um, uh, help. Um, uh, regulate how uh, platforms use data, including um, uh, the, 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 the current version of the AI Act will be published as far as is known on, on next week, on, on the 23rd. Oh, sorry, it's actually tomorrow, right? As time passes, uh, will be published tomorrow. So it'll contain uh, uh, most likely, uh, a, um, uh, at least in the, in the leaked version, uh, duties for, for platforms to share access to specific kinds uh, of data to provide um, to provide uh, a more level playing field to, to newcomers, um, to allow um, possibly more inter, uh, more more let's say more more data, more easier easier uh, data data transfers, and provide for data altruism models, and then finally the AI Act uh, will um, uh, help uh, uh, European EU organs in. Um, um, assessing what kinds of AI can be dangerous, what kinds can be beneficial, uh, without going into too, too much detail now. Um, this will also apply to the AI used, so the automated uh, uh, speech uh, engines used by platforms in um, in um, regulating online uh, online discussion, in in regulating how online uh, online speech happens. So, summing up, all of those rules together. Um, Will form a new kind of um, of, of online um, uh, online speech uh, environment, uh, heavily, much more heavily uh, regulated uh, than before. Um, and I'm going to use the uh, the next uh, uh, ten or so minutes to to discuss with you whether this is the only angle which should matter now, or whether perhaps there is also a, a different uh, angle to uh, platform rules, which we might be uh, forgetting. And I'm uh, mentioning that because uh, there is a, another level of online discourse, which doesn't always figure quite so prominently um, in, in, in our debates. We've talked about human rights. We've talked about European Union rules, right? But um, if we look at how digital policy is being made, we often forget that there's a uh, an important level uh, that is uh, uh, that uh, an important level made up of international uh, standardization of technical standards, um, where actors uh, that are much much less present in in day to day discourses um, are, uh, are are influential. Um, this impacts um, not only how individual platforms uh, uh, deal with content, but on a on a let's say more more basic level, how uh, international uh, data flows are happening, how exchanges of data is happening, how uh, information is uh, is transferred via um, 
uh, via, via the internet. And this is what I meant uh, with that notion I, I mentioned uh, at, at the beginning, you know, this, this normative order of, of, of the internet. We should not, not look only at the hard and soft law applicable to platforms, but also at the in-between and the below, at the normatively relevant uh, uh, standards that impact online uh, uh, communication. Um, just one example, um, a year ago, there was an attempt by uh, Huawei, supported by the Chinese government, to introduce new internet protocol standards through the International Telecommunications uh, Union. Um, that was obviously um, an, an approach by uh, specific actors with their own vested interests to um, change the way that internet uh, communication uh, takes place. Without going into the details of, of that proposal, um, the the uh, the attention paid to that uh, to that uh, suggested change in the way that online communication happens went well, was was much much smaller. So the attention was much much less than that paid to uh, human rights discussions or discussions on rules set by, by 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 platforms. So my call here would be to say, well, let's not only think about the uh, the, the, the rules which we see all the time, the, the human rights standards, the rules of platforms, the way they engage in content. But let's look deeper. Let's always dig deeper. Let's see how platforms, uh, let, let's also look at how, uh, how uh, platforms, let's say, what, what, what platforms rules are, are conditioned on, and that is the international network of, um, of, of, of technical standards that regulate how exchange of information happens in the first place. Let's not think about, let's not forget uh, where the word internet, for instance, comes from. You know, where does internet come from? It's you know, one of those funny questions which you, you, you tend not to ask yourselves, right? Internet connects two words, namely interconnected and networks. So the words interconnected and networks, so internet, right? So that we have different networks. Those networks have to connect. Who sets the rules of how those networks connect? Well, those rules are set by standards. Those standards are set by institutions like the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, um, and others within, for instance, the IEEE. Um, and we do not talk about those often enough. We do not uh, mention them often enough. And this is a, a bit of a loss for, uh, you know, for the critical uh, social scholars, legal scholars, which, uh, which we are. That's sort of the, the technical thing which we're not talking about. We're also not talking about internet governance as a whole enough, right? We're not talking enough about international internet law and internet governance. Those are two, uh, sort of those are the, 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 the normative corollaries to uh, online standards, which are more than sort of the, the technical dimension. Um, yes, it's true. There's no international treaty regarding the internet, right? There's no uh, global internet treaty. There are some, some treaties that apply to specific aspects of the internet. There is, for instance, a treaty on, on cybercrime, right? There are human rights treaties that, as I've mentioned before, apply to, to online speech. There are lots of ITU conventions that regulate specific aspects of, um, well, not so much online, but uh, uh, tele telecommunication in the broader sense. Um, Conventions, uh, including from the World Postal Union, also impact the way that uh, online uh, that, that communication happens. But we do not yet have any hard law international convention regarding online uh, um, data transfer, regarding online uh, online traffic, um, regarding data. The one exception is Convention 108 within the Council of Europe. That, but that one also is looking at things more from an international human rights angle, uh, securing data data protection. But we see, you know, we see the the challenges of that when we look at how how little has happened after the Schrems II Schrems II judgment, uh, when the European Court of, of the European Court of Justice basically in, in invalidated the way that um, two three major major world economies exchange exchange data um 
for instance, are we sure that the current way that the, the cloud services are, are being used uh, in the US, that, the, that, that is legal from a European standpoint? There are very strong arguments to say since Trims 2 that those exchanges of data are no longer uh, no longer legal. But we're all sort of accepting that. Why are we accepting that? Well, because first of all, we want to sort of perhaps not worry about that too much. And secondly, because there is no international treaty regarding that aspect of, of, of communication exchange. So why am I talking about that? Well, because the topic right of today was uh, uh, the the governance of of platforms through soft and through hard law. We've talked about you know the the, the more easier uh, parts of the law, the human rights law. We've talked about private norms, but now uh, we've also mentioned the importance of standards, and we've mentioned now the importance of international internet law and this process of you know developing global rules and applying them, which is called uh, internet. Um, uh, internet governance. Uh, the, the, the importance of those two also um, become evident when you think about what the added value of international law is generally. And that added value is that it is a body of norms, the only body of norms globally that ensures um, certain global public values, right? Certain common values, values common to the international community, to states individually, and to states in, 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 in consortiums or the international uh, community. And also, um, uh, Professor Fogo mentioned, mentioned my, my dissertation from eons ago, which are dedicated to, to studying the role of individuals in international law. In a certain way, individuals also are protected by, uh, by international uh, legal rules. Now, when it comes to the internet, it is international law those rules that we do have, a lot of it is custom, um, that protect certain information related to global public goods, like the stability, like the integrity of the internet. Every time a state, a state, for instance, supports uh, a private actor in attacking uh, another state, um, when, when Russia supports uh, 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 most likely FSB related troops in, um, in, in, in attacking uh, Ukraine based uh, websites, that is a violation of international law, a violation of inter alia the, the principles of sovereignty, the principle of non-interference, depending on the, uh, uh, on, the, on the impact of any individual um, attack. It's also a violation perhaps of the UN Charter, Article 2.4, the prohibition of the use of force. All right, so all of that is part of uh, the international legal protection that the internet and the stability and integrity of the internet enjoys. And as of late, this stability and integrity has been extended to the stability, integrity, functionality, security uh, of, um, uh, of platform-based online communication processes. Uh, in September last year, for instance, the, the German government published a, an opinion on the applicability of international law to cyberspace. And in that opinion, which is available on, on their website, um, the, the German government underscored that it would consider attacks on its information sphere, so on the platforms where information exchanges are happening um, uh, through either disinformation campaigns or through denial of service campaigns or through any, any uh, inter, uh, major interference, especially connected with uh, in, in the period before elections as a violation of its sovereignty to which it would respond in kind uh, through uh, international international legal means. So we see there is a strong trend towards a broader a broader approach to what kind of, of laws are applicable to, to, to online um, uh, to both online platforms and online communication processes and perhaps perhaps you know this this whole this whole presentation is, is a call towards um, no longer focusing so much on the platforms themselves but rather on the communication processes happening online and defending those processes against um, well, in the in, in the words of of uh, of U.S. Uh, of U.S. legislation against all enemies, foreign and domestic, um, and this is something which should not be underestimated, right? So I think we are moving towards a time where we'll see that the integrity of online discourse, the integrity of online discussion spheres, is extremely important, and it has to be protected both against uh, monopolization tendencies 
against um, bad individual um, individual rules against uh, the optimization uh, through algorithmic means uh, towards certain uh, uh, private goals, uh, which um, which do not do not are not you know in keeping with uh, with public values, but also against interferences by other actors, right? A against interferences by state actors and by non-state actors, and we can only protect online communication processes if we understand the the relation of online communication processes to a certain digital uh, digital value system, right? Um, if we only look at individual uh, platforms, we will not understand the importance of ensuring uh, global communication processes, uh, of, of protecting those global communication processes, their integrity, uh, and their their um, uh, and protecting that those processes both from the platforms and from uh, international uh, international actors. So I am fairly convinced that um, the approach we have to use is to understand um, online rulemaking uh, through the lens of a, a multi-level system of, of internet regulation, of internet uh, governance. So if you, if you follow uh, Niklas Luhmann, he will tell you there is no such thing as communication. People cannot communicate, but I wouldn't be going, going so far. Um, uh, the uh, a communication processes, uh, process needs to be protected uh, from losing its integrity. When I say that, I mean um, they're all the actors that try to influence that process in an illegitimate way have to be uh, have to be kept at bay. So, for instance, we have to protect um, discussions happening within a country from uh, uh, the attempt by another country to uh, undermine those processes through disinformation, for instance or through sock puppets, or through uh, uh, grassroots movements that appear to be grassroots, but are actually financed from a, from a third country. Um, one example would be um, if, a, uh, if, a, if a government finances a, a television studio uh, to uh, lie, uh, then this uh, this 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 uh, this television studio will most likely not receive a license in a third country, which is currently happening when with regard to uh, the the Russian foreign television channel RT uh, in Germany. So, this is a way that the legal system helps to immunize communication processes against attacks against those processes. Right? That's, for instance, how that works with regard to television channels. Now, uh, RT, uh, Russia Today, uh, the German edition, also has a YouTube channel. Now, can the German government tell YouTube to, um, to, to, to take the uh, RT's uh, YouTube channel off the air? No, but YouTube did that itself. Why? Because RT had violated YouTube's rule against spreading disinformation on the vaccine, on the effectivity of vaccines. Then they introduced a second channel which YouTube shut down again because it violated YouTube's other one of YouTube's other um, other uh, rules against uh, circumventing a ban. Right. So you see here as an example of one uh, television studio uh, that, by the way, is still you know is still uh, producing t television and, and distributing it. But you see how um, both national law and private rules together. Uh, attempt to uh, safeguard communicative processes. I, one of my one of my, my favorite um, uh, examples is always the the question of of, of privacy opt ins versus privacy opt outs, right? So um, a, a protocol vastly influences human human behavior because humans are lazy, right? Um, and whenever any protocol nudges people in a certain direction, it'll have substantial uh, impact. So, for instance, a, a privacy um, uh, opt-out opt protocol, that is to say, a protocol saying, as, it's, as we have it now, um, usually the, uh, the, the, privacy, uh, 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 the privacy settings within any app should be at the highest possible standards, with people being allowed to opt out of those standards. This will usually lead to a more privacy-conscious communication than if it's the other way around, you know, because people are lazy. Um, one uh, an example where uh, where the implementation of human rights considerations didn't work quite so well is a 
is, is a standard regarding with that name, right? The, the human rights uh, considerations of internet protocol standards, uh, which was a, a standard which um, uh, a colleague of mine, Niels Ted Over, walked on, worked on for, for a long, long time. And the requests for comment on that didn't, um, didn't lead to a very, very helpful discussion on the impact, let's say, on the possibility to include human rights in, in standard setting, because there's this huge disconnect between um, between standard setters on the one hand and the new actors in standard setting processes that believe that standards have to be more, um, well, human rights conscious. And I do see both points, right? So I do see this, this sort of uh, technical, neutral, old school view on standards saying that you know, we have to keep all of those human rights considerations out of standard setting. We, we're seeing some of the replication of that right now when it comes to norms for AI. In Germany, for instance, there's a big, big push of the by the the DIN, the the German Institute for for norms. The, uh, I think it's for norms. <laughs> uh, they're trying to develop um, uh, certain norms regarding AI use to certify AI there. And here, there too, for the first time, they've allowed, um, let's say, human rights actors to be more uh, involved in those processes and philosophers and uh, all kinds of AI and society experts. And this has made the process both extremely interesting, uh, but also extremely difficult. Um, and especially the call for openness for those processes has led to substantial delays in, in developing, uh, developing new standards. But I believe that's important uh, because obviously the standards are closely connected to um, to the other kinds of rules we which we care about so, so deeply first of all when I, when I say that uh, offline offline rights uh, and online rights are the same what I mean by that is um, in the 80s and 90s and on, but also more recently uh, there have been pushes towards uh, developing you know new human rights charters for for the internet um, and I'm very critical of those approaches because they have this um, uh, this this underlying um, this underlying assumption that we need to develop rights to apply online. And that is a bad bad approach because it's not like you divest yourself of your rights once you open up the internet. Uh, and um, especially now, as 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 online communication is you know much more integrated into our daily lives, it's just artificial and bad uh, uh, to to suggest that there is a a, 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 um, a deficiency in, in online human rights, a fundamental deficiency in online human rights protection. I mean, we're online all the time. I mean, when are we not online, right? We're in a clever car, we're in front of a smart fridge. It would be artificial to say that there are different different rights. What I agree with you is that sometimes we use that equivalency a bit too flippantly because of course there are huge differences, right? There are differences between offline and online speech, uh, speed, permanence, um, the way that um, private actors influence how human rights are implemented. So um, I agree that we have to do much more work on, on, on the details of implementing human rights online and that perhaps in the long run, a, uh, you know, another declaration on online rights, sorry, um, uh, another declaration on online rights doesn't actually doesn't actually hurt so much, but I personally think that uh, we do not necessarily need to, to to develop new new rights declarations online. Now, your second question regarding online uh, um, online process, communication processes and legitimate or illegitimate influences. Um, now, I think that uh, historically. Um, we can go back to, to cases like the Nicaragua case in front of the International Court of Justice to understand what internationally legitimate and illegitimate influences by one country uh, over another, by one country over the political sphere, the political discussions in one country uh, are. And um, if you think back to that case, you'll find that, for instance, just, you know, just a uh, uh, throwing out uh, pamphlets from an airplane is not yet an illegitimate uh, 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 an, an illegitimate influence. But for instance, substantially financing the opposition can be considered such an illegitimate influence. And you have to apply those principles to online settings. So for instance, if one state uh, finances uh, a, a, a media uh, platform in another state that, that tries to push certain agenda items that could be considered illegitimate. Now, what if, on the other way around, what if you think of, of, of Voice of America or, or Deutsche Welle, right? Those are also governmental broadcasters financed to push a certain agenda, in that case, 
the agenda is probably described as a you know a, a liberal worldview with a certain European uh, tendency. Is that illegitimate? I would argue no. But could it be considered illegitimate by by other other states? Possibly. I wouldn't say that's a strong argument. But Russia, for instance, right now is making that argument that Deutsche Welle is you know being a horrible German influence uh, on, uh, on 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 Russia's uh, public uh, public discussion sphere. Of course, as a retribution for for the way that they felt that German authorities treated uh, Russia today. Um, they had some uh, Lavrov, for instance, the, the foreign minister actually called the ban by YouTube of uh, of of of, uh, of Russia today a a violation of of, of international uh, law and a strong and a horrible intervention by by the German government, not quite understanding or consciously consciously misinterpreting the fact that it was not the German government but YouTube private company and a US company that actually um, uh, introduced introduced the ban. So my, my answer would be towards that direction, right? So I don't think there are fundamental differences between legitimate or illegitimate interventions in discussion spheres between online and offline. But I think that we can see and trace those influences much easier uh, in, in online settings because we, we know so much more about how, how online uh, discussion takes place, you know? could take you know if you think wow that that's all of that sounds so complicated i i think it doesn't it doesn't because um you just have to um get over the idea that um there are national rules and international rules and those two magisteria don't overlap i think we have to move towards a conception of a global hybrid speech governance model right uh, that includes national laws international laws standards um uh, rules uh, court judgments and that um, that that um, is based on and draws inspiration from more recent court judgments, not only in in, in Germany but also in the Netherlands, in Italy, um, which say uh, pretty pr pretty cons uh, consistently that uh, we have to go beyond focusing only on 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 uh, on private rules, but we have to uh, use public law to correct this power imbalances in, in private settings. And just as this is applied to uh, private uh, private uh, orders uh, that are regulated by platforms, this also is applicable on, on, on a global level. So international rules have to stop states from interfering with uh, online communication practices that uh, are, are, are legal, just as public law within states has to stop platforms from monopolizing online discussion or from arbitrarily um, uh, arbitrarily optimizing just for profit and not for public, um, public values. And one of the more interesting developments in that regard is, uh, if I may say so, the so-called social media councils. So the uh, platform Bayret, uh, the um, organs that some companies have started to give themselves to improve the way that the rules which they apply are, are made and implemented. Facebook, for instance, has uh, developed uh, its, uh, its Facebook oversight board. Other platforms have, have similar and smaller uh, entities like that. Uh, TikTok has a security council, uh, sorry, a, a content, content security council. Um, uh, Twitter is, 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 uh, is experimenting with, uh, with individual councils. So we're seeing this trend towards an attempt by platforms to provide democratic legitimacy, or let's say a semblance, a semblance of democratic legitimacy to their own rules. Obviously, you can't elect Mark, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, at least he, 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 he's not one who, who, who can be elected, um, but it is platforms that have noticed that the legitimacy of their own rules is in doubt, is in question. Uh, so what are they doing? They're telling the public, you know, I'm just simplifying a tiny bit, they're telling the public, hey, if you don't like our rules, let's enter into a conversation about how to make them better. And I think this is something which we will see much more in the future. We will see platforms and other uh, social media actors, generally any powerful private uh, norm setter, to see that just as states in the past have had to react towards the demands of people to be more responsive to their needs in order not to lose their legitimacy, we will see this happening more and more as people wake up to the importance of rule uh, setting and rule execution in private communication spaces. And we will see a stronger, a stronger position uh, for, for individuals, for humans, 
when it comes to um, to the rules that apply to to online uh, communication. And I'm very happy that you know you're all on this journey uh, and will be able to will be able to support each other in, in finding out how best to uh, to design those rules and to implement those rules. If you're interested, please do do get in contact with me. Uh, this is one of the topics I love writing about. Um, I'm very happy for any, you know, any, any comments uh, now or, or later. Thank you so much for having me.